So our next presentation uh, is by Dr. Hugh Gellibert on reducing contrast and radiation exposure during endovascular active interventions. Uh, Dr. Gellibert is professor of surgery in our division. Just as a side note in terms of radiation exposure, I can tell you that uh, I uh, saw my ophthalmologist a few months ago and uh, he says, you know, you have a little, uh, little haziness in your lens. Uh, and I said, well, maybe I should start using uh, leaded glasses. And uh, he says, how old are you? And when I told him my age, he says, don't worry about it. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Go ahead. So the plus minus is of being a little bit older. Um, good morning, everyone. Dr. Quinones, thank you so much for the invitation to present today. I think I have the pleasure of being kind of the school marm, so to speak, and tell you a little bit about radiation exposure and uh, a little bit of how to reduce it, contrast and radiation. So uh, disclosure-wise, I'm happy or unhappy to say none. Nonetheless, this is the problem. This is actually Medicare data. And just looking at the uh, incidence of uh, open versus endovascular repair of uh, AAA, and you can see, we all know, that endovascular repair has outpaced it. And that's just in for renal abdominal aortic aneurysm. So the issue is that we have increased complexity, increased duration of cases, increased contrast and radiation dose. Is that a problem? Um, yeah, it is a problem for many things. The number of uh, CT scans, this is a, a study looking at a, in the San Francisco Bay Area, the number of CT scans went up from 3 million to 70 million. That's astounding. Uh, and not only that, there's a risk of cancer associated with that. Uh, a single CT scan in some people will deliver almost as much as some of the survivors of the Nagasaki bomb, which is kind of a shocking thought. This is, uh, in this study, they're looking at the radiation doses and the variation on the radiation doses provided. And one of the observations they made is that there's a huge uh, variation in uh, protocols. A routine head of CT may give you two millisieverts, a multi-phase abdominal contrast may give you 31 millisieverts. So they found that the radiation doses provided were higher than expected, more variable than expected, and had a significant risk. Uh, another paper looking at mean radiation doses, and it's worth looking at these, uh, for an EVAR, 12.6 millisieverts, for CT angio, 15, for reintervention, again, it's going to be 6 to 15, but then the problem is the follow-up CT scans, and if these people get CT scans every year for the next 10, 15 years of their lives, then the radiation can be cumulatively very high. Um, I like this slide just because it's very graphic, and it says on the very far left, the risk of cancer. Uh, and then the study appropriate. So with a PET-CT scan, uh, you get 30 to 32 millisieverts, and that may translate up to one in 650 patients who get that will get a cancer secondary to it. Significant, significant radiation. So a few fundamentals of radiation therapy. Uh, we all know that ionizing radiation, X-rays, gamma rays on the far end of the spectrum, uh, they're electromagnetic radiation, uh, they penetrate tissue, obviously. Uh, they're generated because of a cathode and anode hitting a tungsten target, and when the electron goes through the nucleus, an X-ray uh, is generated. There's two effects that we need to know of, and I think this is worth keeping in mind. There's the stochastic effects, which are the threshold, and those are the ones that cause cancer, and then the deterministic effects, which are dose-related, and those are the ones that cause burns and loss of skin. Uh, units are usually grays or reds. Grays are more common nowadays, and millisieverts or sieverts really is the dose uh, which is received for unit tissue. Um, key thing, and we'll come back to this a little bit, everyone should be familiar with a low, as low as reasonably achievable radiation imaging. Uh, we need to minimize the time, the distance and shielding are key elements in all of this. It minimizes the time exposure, the distance from the source, and shielding for the protect the, uh, the docs. Um, Pursuant to your ophthalmologic exam, I just had an ophthalmologic exam, and I'm glad to say I don't have any clouding in my corneas yet, my lens, but <laughs> the word is yet, right? Uh, at any rate, the, the lens is uh, sensitive in skin, and these are the quarterly dose um, uh, adjustments that are OSHA recommended. Um, obviously, when we're doing II imaging with an intensifier, the x-ray tube sources on the bottom, there's a lot of scatter from the primary beam on the bottom, there's scattered forward scatter from the beam as it exits the patient. The fact of the matter is that there's haze, there's waves of radiation in the area. And that's why shielding for us, not only for us, but our patients is very, very important. Um, 
So apron, thyroid, glasses. Yes, Dr. Quinones glasses. We'll buy you those for Christmas. Um, <laughs> uh, a few things. Uh, in terms of doses and, uh, and risk, and at least at our institution, if you have higher doses, we're supposed to inform our patients, we're supposed to call them back at a later period of time and inspect them. There's a threshold of two to 3,000 uh, milligrays, and if you pass that threshold, then your risk of uh, skin erythema and burn starts going up. If you're uh, five to 10,000, it tends to be transient erythema, secondary epilation, loss of the hair. 10 to 15, you'll have dry, moist desquamation, and beyond that, you're gonna have ulceration, necrosis, infection. Call your plastic surgeons, they're gonna to have to do skin flaps. Um, solutions to the problem then. Uh, this was an interesting paper from JVS, looking at just this a few years ago, and really um, going through what we talked about as low as possible. Keep in mind, chest x-ray, the natural background radiation is 0.3 rads per year. Uh, typical fluoroscopy procedure can be one between 60 minutes in this study. And CT scan, we've gone through this. Boost fluoroscopy and CNA fluoroscopy, as you see at the very bottom, provide very, very high doses of radiation. So the first thing we can do is minimize the amount of radiation we give our patients. The uh, II, the image intensifier, should be as close to the patient as uh, possible in order to reduce their imaging, uh, rather the radiation dose, and use the inverse square law. So if people can stand away from the radiation source, they're gonna be safer. These are all points that I think are very important. Uh, use ultrasound imaging whenever you're possible for your access. I know some people use fluoroscopy to guide their puncture of the vessels themselves, for example. Uh, position the II, use exposure pedals very sparingly, pulse fluoroscopy, uh, meaning you pulse your fluoroscope, you don't have it continuous. Uh, view saved images. I mean, a lot of us do that, but you have to keep these things in mind. Collimate your field. Use high doses only when necessary, and minimize your overlap. Uh, other things you can do, those radiation-resistant drapes, not, they're kind of expensive, not really very popular. There are radiation detectors. You can put them on the staff, on the patient. Mostly use experimentals for studies of radiation dosing. Some of the new uh, radiation doses, uh, I mean uh, detectors, are audible. So they'll ping when they have a certain threshold just to remind the staff that exposure is going on. And then ultrasound. I like this paper just as an example of using ultrasound. There are places where ultrasound, in this case IVUS, is actually more sensitive than actually see, uh, intraoperative angiography. And so we should embrace that. If anyone's doing EVAR and TVAR without, and FIVARs without IVUS, I think you're kind of doing yourself a little bit of a disservice. This one paper was looking at the uh, accuracy of uh, IVUS versus angio uh, or CTA in identifying different uh, anatomic uh, abnormalities. And, and really, the IVUS gave them very accurate measurements. And then finally, I think maybe a lot of us have thought of the holy grail of, uh, of reducing contrast and iodination and radiation are the fusion images uh, techniques. And there's a number of papers. This is a meta-analysis, which is in the European Journal of Vascular Surgery from last year. But they looked at 30, 31 studies, uh, 31 studies, uh, TAAs, uh, EVARs, fenestrated graphs, branch graphs. And they compared the total uh, iodinated contrast, total procedure time, fluoro time. And then what they found was that really the, the, the uh, um, the fusion images resulted in a, in a reduction of contrast, reduction of procedure time, uh, slight reduction in radiation. Significant, yes, not walloping. Uh, this is an image of what they're using the fusion overlays for, uh, helping with the uh, cannulation. It's a combination of registering preoperative CT scans with uh, intraoperative uh, imaging that had been taken. Uh, some other uh, papers are a little bit divergent. Zoli, your uh, CT surgery, they reduced their uh, radiation exposure. Uh, Heralt spoke about reducing the contrast. Uh, this was a recent one I found in Endovascular Today, that journal, that Paragon journal. But nonetheless, they said the results for EVAR uh, performed with fusion were most studies still a reduction of contrast. That's probably true. Uh, but roughly equivalent or higher radiation exposure. And the radiation exposure is all operator dependent, how you do your case in the operating room. So if in their case, they said they could reduce this by using very sparing technique. So I think uh, radiation exposure, this was uh, another paper that I thought was important just to bring out really the last line of this. And this is a suggestion in Annals uh, uh, Archives of Internal Medicine. Uh, and it says that ways to reducing the radiation exposure will um, standardize CT protocols, reduce the number of CTs exams, but track and collect dose information at the patient level as they undergo repeated imaging over time. And that's beginning to seep down into our procedures 
I know in the Veterans Hospital, for example, we're supposed to record these and, again, track the patients if their doses get high. So there's a push on to track and record the cumulative dose exposure towards patients, and this may in itself work itself into a, a government uh, mandate. Uh, so concluding, increased use of endovascular techniques and increased the complexity of cases resulting in increased exposure to contrast and to uh, radiation. Uh, really being aware of the safety principles, careful attenuation technique, attention technique, and use of adjunctive imaging. I think the development of advanced imaging technology, fusion imaging, remains to be seen. Probably not the panacea we're all hoping for, but certainly if used appropriately, it will help a lot. Um, and I'll thank you with that. There's nothing wrong with the cut down. And the alternative access options are uh, increasingly common as we increase the complexity of endovascular approaches. Uh, upper extremity work can be done uh, through the brachial, through the axillary. We've actually had a couple of uh, thoracic stent grafts put through the subclavian by a conduit. Um, again, do it emergently, uh, electively, not emergently.